Hey, hey everyone. everyone. Hi, guys. Hello. So, welcome to the Photo Focus Hangout. My name's Rich Harrington. I am the publisher of Photo Focus, and I'm just going to take a, a brief moment just to sort of set the stage and, and uh, then step out of the way so these guys can talk. Uh, we have launched new Google Hangouts happening every month. So this is our now regular Hangout about all things Lightroom, and we'll have a Hangout coming out under our Triple Exposure series. Uh, our next one is going to be about HDR, but we'll also, in that Triple Exposure series, cover panoramics, HDR, and time-lapse. So we're going to be moving to having two regular Google Hangouts. If you're not familiar with PhotoFocus, just check out PhotoFocus.com. We publish three stories a day, all about photography, tips, techniques, shooting, and post. We've got a regular podcast series that you could subscribe to. We've got ebooks, lots of great things to help you out. Now, with that in mind, uh, today's Hangout is brought to you thanks to the folks over at Mosaic and at Photoshop World. And I'd like to turn things over uh, to the guys to start to just tell you what you're going to learn today. And I'm just going to be quiet now and start to watch myself. Thank you very much, Rich. It is uh, good to be here. I'm Gerard Murphy. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Mosaic, and it's my distinct pleasure to welcome two of our three uh, guest, um, guests today. Uh, first, I'll start uh, with Rob Sylvan. Uh, Rob is from the most beautiful state in the, uh, I think, the entire world. Uh, what state is that, Rob? New Hampshire. Uh, that's right. It happens to also be my home state, so I can't complain. Um, and it only took Rob 15 hours to dig out from his driveway this morning, I think. Something like that, right? Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. yeah. Rob, Rob has the wonderful uh, blog himself called Light Rumors, um, and he's also a contributor to Photo Focus, and he's also the author of this fine book, which I am just so proud to say that I have an autographed copy of, <laughs> <laughs> which is, makes me like the most VIP person in the world, um, on Lightroom 5. Um, and so we're actually giving away a free e-version of that book. Um, if you look in the chat window, there's a link there, so please give us your email address and we will enter you in for a chance to win that, as well as a six-month six subscription to Mosaic. Um, so welcome, Rob. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Uh, the other, uh, one of the other fine guests we have is Levi Sim. Levi is uh, on the website sdesignsphotography.com. He is a contributor to Photo Focus as well, uh, and an uh, amazing, beautiful photographer, uh, specializes in portraits, landscapes, uh, good black and white stuff, uh, all around amazing, good dude with a cool hat. Uh, please welcome Levi Sim as well uh, from the beautiful state of Oregon, right? That's right. I'm just about as far away from you and, and Rob as I can possibly two, be. Two beautiful places. Um, and uh, Levi, you're going to introduce uh, Brian, right? Yes. Now Brian is right down here down the coast from me in California in the Bay Area. Is that right, Brian? Yep. Excellent. And Brian is a product manager for Adobe and uh, in charge of Photoshop and Lightroom. Is that right, Brian? Uh, Pho yeah, mainly Photoshop. I've mainly evangelized Photoshop. Lightroom since it first came out. Excellent, excellent. And uh, and Brian, and Brian literally Brian wrote like the a book red too. He looks like he's uh, in his own black and white conversion. Uh, <laughs> I we need have, a black we have, and white we have, we have split toning of uh, <laughs> Brian right now. Excellent. And Brian literally wrote the book a few times on black and white finishing in Photoshop and Lightroom and so we're so pleased to have him with us today uh, as we discuss some of the better ways to finish your your photos in, in black and white. Thank and, you. Uh, thank you for being here Brian. Thanks. Cool. So b before we, we kick off the, uh, the sort of content, uh, just a couple of things. I, there is a contest going on right now sponsored by Mosaic and I already mentioned it once but I'll mention it one more time. In the uh, Q&A section, if you head over to that link there, uh, you'll be able to see uh, a way that you can enter in your email address to be entered into a free six-month online backup uh, service from uh, Mosaic. Uh, that also includes the two-way sync app. Um, and uh, the other grand prize is uh, a free ebook from Rob Sylvan. Um, I believe that uh, also everybody that enters will be getting a free uh, Lightroom black and white preset uh, that the Levi Sim will be making and will be emailing to people uh, after um, after the hangout is over, uh, <laughs> which I think Levi forgot about until this moment, which is fantastic. <laughs> no, I've, I've got it ready to go. Oh, yeah, okay, that's good. That's, part, that's good. I'm glad to see that. Um, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll use your download link. <laughs> exactly. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll email that to folks. Excellent. Excellent. So um, let's talk a little bit about black and white. I mean, uh, Rob, I'll kick it over to you. Do you? Um, what types of images do you use 
do you treat with black and white? And, and do you do that um, in the camera itself, or do you shoot in color and then rely on, on programs like Lightroom to convert over to black and white? Um, yeah, well, I, I kind of really got bit by the photography bug after digital came out, so I am not one of those folks who has the long storied history in shooting black and white, and I always feel somewhat inadequate because of that, but it is what it is. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so I, I have come to black and white through digital, and so um, I thought one of the things we could talk about, and I'd love to hear from Brian and, and, and Levi as well, is, you know, what, how, when you're shooting with black and white as your ultimate destination, you know, is there anything different you want to think about when you're setting up your camera? Um, one of the questions I get on the Lightroom help desk all the time is often to do with how different your photos can look after they come into Lightroom from versus how the camera uh, settings might have been if you use a picture style in your camera um, and how that changes in Lightroom. Well, black and white, if you're shooting in RAW uh, and you're and using a monochrome picture style, even if you've altered it in some ways, uh, Lightroom can't read that. Lightroom can't understand that. So you'll see black and white on your on your L camera's LCD, but if you're shooting in RAW, it's still it's still color data. So um, some people find it interesting to actually shoot raw using a monochrome uh, picture style just to see what that looks like on their camera to kind of pre-visualize it a little bit. Um, I tend not to do that just because I like to just shoot in color and then I find uh, kind of coming from this digital approach too uh, that a really good color image uh, can be can be one that can make a really good black and white image because it gives you a lot of really uh, interesting colors to work on separating out uh, and I, I kind of used to think that like living in New Hampshire looking out my window right now it's, it's almost a monochrome scene uh, and I used to think that you know that would make a good black and white but I found that you, it's a lot more fun and it's a lot more interesting to really get an interesting color image with with some different colors in it uh, and to take that into a black and white conversion. So, so I mean, maybe I'm mistaken, and maybe one of you guys can answer this. But um, when when shooting, when using the camera settings to create black and white, are you no longer shooting in RAW, or when you shoot in bl the black and white settings in most DSLRs, does it automatically convert it over to JPEG? Maybe I just have um, outdated information, but I I used to think that when you you could not shoot in RAW and as well as in black and white mode. Uh, in most DSLR cameras, is that well? Is that I, true? I can only speak to Nikon, but it's a picture. It's a picture style, n really no different than Vivid or Landscape, in that um, as far as if you're shooting in RAW. So ra uh, the setting for your JPEG or RAW is one setting, and then your setting for your picture style is another. And I'm pretty sure Canon's the same way. Uh, I can't speak to others uh, that I haven't used. I've um, done this. Yeah, I've I've done it in both Sony and Pentax and Canon and Nikon cameras, setting uh, setting the the picture setting to monochrome. It, it's picture style or um, or image style. It, it's named different things in different cameras. And then if you're still shooting in RAW, like you say, it it's still the RAW image and it comes in color on your computer. So if you want to get the camera's black and white and have a raw image, then you can switch to raw plus JPEG, and that'll give you the best of both worlds. It'll let you have the color raw image on your computer as well as that great uh, black and white JPEG that your camera can make, too. Brian, do you have any experience with that? Yeah, obviously I'm very biased if you ask the software guy <laughs> doing your software editing. He's not going to tell you to do it in the camera. Um, I was trying to give you guys a layup, Brian, man. I started yeah, yeah, I appreciate that. <laughs> uh, I, I think that you might want to use a, a larger screen and um, <laughs> and something that's got a little higher fidelity. Um, all joking aside, uh, there are you know there are cameras that shoot just black and white. There are cameras that can be configured for just black and white. Uh, there's the Leica that that's all it does is shoot monochrome. Um, but with a few exceptions, I would shoot all color raw uh, and then do black and white conversion in software on the desktop. You know in Lightroom. Uh, a lot of the time you'll end up not only thinking that you wanted to shoot black and white and shoot color or you'll shoot color and then you'll end up going black and white or in some cases you'll want both and that's where something like a virtual copy is awesome is you can have the best of both worlds and that's where it's really different from the film days is in the film days you swapped in your black and white film and you really had to have this mental shift 
which I encourage people to have when they want to shoot black and white. Um, but you were stuck with it. That's what you were shooting, and you were going to burn through that roll, um, or you were going to leave a bunch of you know unexposed film, and then you're going to switch back. Um, so you really you you have that flexibility on the editing side now. And and that's great. I mean, I I, um, I totally agree with you. I guess it, it's sort of a segue to that question too, Brian. Is once you get a, a color photo into Lightroom, do you color correct in color? Or do you immediately convert to black and white and then try to change the colors? Um, and which way do you find seems to work better for your workflow? Yeah, I absolutely. I, you know, I, I talk about this at, at Photoshop World, and I, I, I talk about black and white quite a bit. And I really encourage people, as much as it, I think it is important if you want to shoot black and white fine art or landscapes or whatever to, to make that mental shift. But I work an image in color as far as I possibly can. And I find that a, a good color image is... The, you know, the key foundation to having a great black and white image because you can see all those different channels of color. Once you push it to monochrome, you don't know what's purple, what's magenta, what's orange. Um, and a lot of the time along the way, you'll think, oh, this is going to be a great black and white image, but you'll take it so far in color, you'll realize, actually, this is a better color image. So I, I work them all the same way, and black and white, is uh, the conversion is something I do pretty late in the process. That, that makes sense. I, I mean, I've seen a lot of photographers who will start off and say, oh, well, I want this as a black and white image, and the, the first step they do is they'll convert it to black and white or, or apply that treatment, and then they'll start messing with the colors, and I'm not sure that's the, the sort of right approach as you talked about. Um, Rob, Rob you, you've also talked about in the past the, the importance or non-importance of white balance um, in, uh, in black and white images. I mean, could you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, let me uh, let me just jump back. And I want to mention something just for what Brian reminded me um, <clears throat> about Photoshop World. I have uh, I've been in Brian's class at Photoshop World many times, um, as it's uh, usually in the Lightroom track. And for those of you who don't know what Photoshop World is, it's uh, it's a conference that happens twice a year, and it's coming up this April. Brian, you're going to be there, right? Yep. Um, you're not teaching your black and white class this time, though, are you? For the first time in years, I'm not. I, I ended up doing some new ones. Yeah, excellent. I'm looking forward to that. But Photoshop World is a conference uh, for mainly Photoshop, but there is a dedicated Lightroom track. Uh, I usually am kind of in there, as they call it, moderator. I help uh, introduce instructors, and I get to... We're kind of like the AV geek squad from high school. We wheel <laughs> our carts in, and we set up and uh, and hang out in there. It's a and lot of fun. And you throw free T-shirts, too. I do. I'm you actually got, wearing you got, you one got an now. Arm. I'm wearing You're a Lightroom T-shirt. I got last Photoshop World uh, in, as a giveaway. Didn't It didn't fit the attendee who won it, so he, he kindly gave it to me. <laughs> um, but uh, we have a, uh, a coupon for $50 off we're going to be posting uh, that will get you for $50 off the full conference pass at Photoshop World. It's April 8th through the 10th in Atlanta. Uh, then it also happens again in uh, Vegas in September. Not sure of the dates on that one yet, but uh, I'll be there. Uh, Gerard, you going to come down this time? Uh, I'm not sure about the Atlanta one. I'm usually at the Vegas one. You're usually um, at the Vegas one. And yeah. so uh, I, if, I do love winter in New England, but I might be able to be convinced yeah. to head to Atlanta in a couple weeks. Yeah, no kidding. Well, uh, so I, I just want to mention that. We'll put that code up there, but it just triggered that memory of, of mine. Um, well, when I think about white balance with black and white, as we start talking about conversion techniques, is depending on how you convert to black and white, uh, changing the white balance even after the fact, even though you may have adjusted it for color and it looks great as a color image, you may find that as one more kind of tool in your bag of tricks to tweak the white balance uh, to actually affect the look of your black and white conversion kind of down the road as well. So we can take a look at that when we when we get into that part of the things. Awesome. I mean, maybe we can um, we can start with uh, with Levi and, and and dive into maybe a screen share. I mean, one thing that I use a lot when I um, when I'm doing a black and white image is I'll, I'll try to do a virtual copy of that image um, and see. All right, I'll treat this one with color. I'll take it as far as you know, like Brian said, as far as I could in color. And then I'll make a virtual copy and start to apply a black and white treatment. Um, hey, Levi, do you think you could uh, show us how to do that in Lightroom? You, you betcha. I'd love to do that. Um, I'm just pulling up my favorite picture right here to share with you. Your I'll favorite switch one. To, ooh, ooh, some favorite. Well, some favorite ones. It's hard to say. So it's hard the to favorite choose. one. Yes. Yeah, I know. It's hard to. Uh, and then if I if I choose my very well, and then the person who's in that picture is 
pleased, and then the people in the other pictures say, well, what about my picture? <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's right. Yeah, I was like, are oh, you opening a can of worms right there, Levi? That's right. Your favorite. Yeah. That's right. Oops. Here we go. Desktop 2. Start screen share. We are on. Here we go. So here I've got this portrait, and I feel like the color is looking pretty good on it. Um, and I've done, I've actually taken this through Lightroom, adjusting my color and, and tones, and then I've also put a few finishing effects on it in um, Nick uh, Color Effects 4. And now I'd like to see what a, what a black and white version looks like. So just like Rob was just saying, I'll make a virtual copy. And to do that, I press Command or um, the Apple key, or if you're on a, on a PC, it's, it's Control, and then the Quote key, or, or the apostrophe. Or you can also just right-click on the picture and then choose Create Virtual Copy, but that's really slow. So press Control or Command Quote, and you get a virtual copy, and you see that pop up just right down here. Now I've got two versions, and it didn't create. This is so cool. I, like, it's like miraculous or a real boon from the gods to have virtual copies. It doesn't create a new file on my computer. It only exists right here in Lightroom, and it allows me full uh, <coughs> full uh, options to do anything I want with it. Um, was it was it some who who was it that said if you can't undo you can't say what if, and so this this allows us to explore all the what ifs in the world of of Lightroom. And so um, w what I do to do a black and white now would just be um, then since I've got my color all set, I'll click on the, the black and white tab here, or plus press the V key is what I usually do. And that gives me the, the color channels mixed up. Instead of, instead of using just the saturation slider up here in, uh, in the basic tab to just remove color, that, that sucks all the color out of the image, but doesn't leave me control of the tones in the image, uh, of the color channels like we were just talking about. And so with, with the color channels here, now I can grab the targeted adjustment tool and just come over and hover on any particular spot and then click and drag up or down, and down darkens that tone, and up, whoa, that's creepy, up brightens that tone. <laughs> and so I like, I like to, to brighten the skin tones generally, um, and you'll see that that's affecting the orange and red sliders over here in my color channels. And one of the great effects of that is that it virtually eliminates um, pimples and blemishes and zits without even retouching the picture because those are, are red tones and they get brightened and just blend into the rest of the skin. So I love that. And then I could I could come around here in the rest of this picture and uh, and hover. You know, it was a really color colorful scarf. So I could come through and find a green or blue spot and just drag that downward to add a little bit more contrast. Here's before and after. It adds a, a little darker line to some of those. I kind of like that. I could come into my background and see what colors are showing up. Looks like uh, my background is showing as a, as a blue tone. If I brighten that back up, that would, that would change things that way. But I love this. And then, um, and then I could like that and hit another virtual copy. And maybe I want to do a tone curve change now and see see the difference between those two so I could brighten my lights just a little bit more. Also, I'm going to press J to turn on my highlight clipping just to make sure that I don't blow out her face. Um, these blue areas are places that are completely clipped black, and then anything showing red, like the center of her eye right there where that highlight is, is um, that was showing red. Turn that back on. That's still on. Does it not show up when I'm zoomed in? Never noticed that before. Uh, anyway, that that red spot says that that spot is a clipped highlight, um, and then I'll I'll drag the darks downward just a little bit. And maybe I'll bring the blacks up a touch. We'll see about that. And then Thanks. I can compare that with the previous picture just by hitting the arrow key and going back and seeing which I like more. So so Levi, you tend to to work um, down in the HSL model a module a sub panel within the Lightroom development module. You don't just hit the basic and hit color treatment equals black and white. Right, there's a, there's the same button. And that button is the same as clicking this button. Okay. Um, 
it just this this just gives me the the further control. A little bit more control the, with the, with the chat tool. Right, right, right. right. Now, um, because we have both Rob and Brian here, I'm going to ask a a somewhat silly question that I think a lot of people will want to hear the answer to, which is, why are there eight colors here? Like, or wh- wh- how? Why did you choose these somewhat random colors? Um, and I think Rob might have the somewhat of the answer on his uh, board behind him, right? Well, I can't speak to why uh, in terms of what what they were thinking, but um, I just put this little color wheel up and uh, actually for two reasons. One, I guess it's it's useful to to think about when even in black and white is the relationships between colors, but um, there's another uh, e-book, a a black and white e-book that um, I I wanted to just give a shout out to uh, at the end, but... um, this is really a simple way to do it, is just draw a triangle and write your RGB and then do an upside triangle, do your CMY, and it, it really can help you understand the relationships between the opposite colors. And when you're thinking about um, making your adjustments, but when you're thinking about, like what we said earlier, about having a really good color image, it's going to give you a lot more data, a lot more really uh, useful tools to make your color conversion, kind of like what Levi is showing with with that particular image. And if you can understand the relationships between uh, colors and, and their opposites, it can really help you in terms of how you're thinking about how you're going to approach uh, separating out those colors in this grayscale image to get your maximized effect. Now, why uh, the software engineers made those choices, maybe Brian could speak to that. Uh, well, I can tell you that you know uh, a lot of the folks on the Lightroom team came from the Photoshop team. Uh, it's Mark Hamburg's you know, pet project, and he and Thomas Knoll, who originally did Photoshop, um, did did Lightroom. You know, almost we're coming up on ten years now, pretty soon, uh, and it's it was our first foray really into subtractive software. And the world had changed so much since Photoshop first came about. You know, when Photoshop uh, launched, there were no digital cameras to speak of. It was one image at a time. It was scans and photo CDs and stuff like this. So when it was time for Lightroom, we, we thought about the whole experience end to end, and we thought about this notion of these sort of task-based workspaces. And we also realized that the sort of person who was going to use Lightroom was a much broader audience than the sort of person who was going to use Photoshop. Um, and the two were meant to work together, but Lightroom needed to be approachable. And so you'll see that with the terminology throughout the application. And instead of having scary things like Cyan and Kelvin and these, you know, very design-oriented, uh, you know, color descriptors. You do see friendlier terms like orange and aqua and purple. You will never find orange and aqua and purple in Photoshop. Um, so the intent throughout the application is to say, this can be fun. Um, you can make mistakes. You've got a safety net. This is easy. Something you do in one place can be shared with others. Uh, it's really, it, it's not just a, a different way of developing software, it's a different way of presenting the interface as well. So you'll see that sort of, you know, friendly guidance throughout the app. So, so I, I, this has always been a question for me, um, that now that I have you here, I can ask it. Um, and it might be a real knob question, but I'm, I'm happy to do it. it um, the difference between grayscale and um, sort of Photoshop and these colors that you have more options with, or seemingly more options with, um, is that is that a a presentation of the options, or does grayscale and photography? What does it have to do with these colors here? Yeah, so grayscale and Photoshop nukes all of that information, and it it really it discards a ton of data. It actually it has its uh, it has its benefits. It's really great for if you want to email a black and white conversion. Um, if you make a black and white conversion, and then you want to just boy, the light changes so dramatically there. Yeah, um, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, but it you know there's there's some good points for using Grayscale in Photoshop, but just remember that as far as editing goes, you're losing so much information. Um, One of the funny things in Lightroom is that in the first couple versions, for as friendly as they made everything, um, you notice it's it's we when it's a good thing, it's they when it's bad. (laughs) Um, (laughs) I I totally understand that. Don't worry, I didn't say They called it Grayscale, Um, but now we call it black and white. (laughs) I do love how friendly it is. It's so good. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice. So um, uh, maybe we could talk about a little bit about presets then. Um, do you well, guys... and, and Sorry, could, I, could I pipe in? There was, there was one question. Uh, Six asked a great question. 
and and prompted this idea too. In Lightroom, if you have made any changes, then um, to your original picture, if you hit the backslash key, it'll show you. Am I in Lightroom? There we go. It'll show you the before you took the before you made any changes, and your after. So. If I if I create a virtual copy and then do a black and white adjustment, hitting the backslash key shows me my my black and white and color adjustment uh, as it shows my color as my before and my black and white as my after. And so that that's really a handy little thing too. So yes, six. That's why I like to do that. Anyway. That's a that's a great great tip from six. Um, speaking of the Q and A, Pat, I see a lot of people putting in there. Um, their email address is there, which is great, and we'll, we'll use those for the contest. Um, there is a link up at the top. If you could put your email address in that, that'll automatically enter you in for the contest. I'm realizing that I was posting the link to our internal chat, uh, not to the <laughs> outside chat. So you are welcome, Brian, Levi, and uh, Rob, for the link to the contest, which you're not eligible for. Um, so th thanks again, Levi, for, for that, that great tip from Six. Um, and also the, the hitting the Y uh, hotkey will show you the before before and after in one one fell, on one panel, uh, which is a great for comparisons. Um, did anybody guys want to talk about using some of the Lightroom presets before we, we dig deeper into you know how do we actually use um, do more of what Levi was showing us? Yeah, and, and sorry, one last thing, Rob. I wanted to uh, or Gerard, I wanted to uh, I just wanted to give a shout out to Mosaic for sponsoring the show. Um, Mosaic provides backup and on-the-go Lightroom connectivity. So I can I can connect to my Lightroom catalog at Starbucks on my iPad and see my complete catalog. I can meet a client elsewhere and show them their their entire catalog of pictures right there on my iPad without um, without being connected to all, all my pictures on my server. It's really wonderful. Plus it's a backup. So like the other day when I left my um, hard drives on the plane, I wasn't that worried about it because <laughs> because the raw files were backed up in my mosaic, and I think that's awesome. Do you, do you have a, a quick uh, mention on that? Oh, thank you. I mean, you, you did it. You did it better than me. Maybe you should be CEO. Um, <laughs> you're hired, Levi. Um, no, thanks. Yeah, you can you can basically start with a free account. Go to the App Store. Go to MosaicArchive.com. Get a free account. Your most recent 2,000 photos will be synchronized and always be in your pocket. Um, the idea there is that um, we constantly are forgetting to push them to different places. This is a private gallery where you can show off your most recent photos to your friends. And if you upgrade to a paid account, you can rate, star, and flag your photos on the go from your iPhone or iPad. You can get more than 2,000 images on your iPhone or iPad. And we also add online backup of your raw or your original images as well. So uh, please do check us out. We, we, we really appreciate your business. And we are photographers just like you. And so we're a company of photographers just like you guys. So thanks for supporting us. Awesome. Uh, OK, right. back to presets. Commercial, commercial over. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, um, if you, uh, yeah, who wants, to, who wants to talk about presets? Because we all, we all love presets, or at least I think we do, right? So, um, oh, I love, I'll, I'll go. I love presets. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in fact, I'll, I'll show you right here some of my favorite presets for black and white are not converting to black and white because I, I like to have final controls over that. Um, although I, I've, I've recently created a, a new preset that I think does a pretty good job of mimicking my camera's black and white. The, the beauty of the camera's black and white is that it includes color filters like I would have used on film, which changes the way that tones are interpreted in the, in the final image. And I love that about the camera's black and white. But I love having a raw file to work from as well. There's just, it's, it's just better. You know, I can, I can do the sharpening myself, and I can do um, local tonal adjustments with, such, with, with much more finesse than I can on a, black, on a JPEG. Um, and so I've created a, a, my Levi's red filter, and that's the one I'll share with everybody. But my very favorite presets for black and white are uh, split toning presets. And, and one of them that Scott Kelby introduced us all to a few years ago on his blog uh, is, I call it Kelby 28, because he sets the hue in the shadows of the split toning tab. He sets the hue to 28 and the saturation to 17, and it just gives this, this subtle little look. Can you guys even see that? on your screens. Okay, so it's, it's a real subtle um, 
sepia-ish tone. I mean, sepia is a very specific tone, and I don't really like it. But when people see this, they call it, oh, I love that sepia. So, you know, you don't correct people and say, oh, that's not really sepia. That's Kilby's 28 hue setting. Do, do, do you want to talk, take a step back and talk about split toning in general? Because um, I think that there's a lot of confusion around what exactly does split toning do and where does it apply those colors and what's the difference between the highlights and the shadows. So um, I'm not sure who wants to, uh, to talk a little bit about you know why split toning matters and, and when we should apply it. Well, I've, I've got a quick analogy for that, and then maybe Brian can help me clean it up. Um, sure. For black and whites, you've got, well, so in split toning, you've got two settings. You've got highlights and you've got shadows. And you can add a color to the highlights and then increase the saturation to make it a little bit more uh, dense, kind of, um, or, or to the shadows. And in black and whites, I would compare this to uh, the ink and the paper. And if you tint the highlights, then it's like tinting the paper because just the stuff that's white will show through with color. Whereas if you tint the shadows, it's kind of like tinting the ink. Everything that was black ends up with a tint. And then you yeah. can also adjust what's considered a highlight and what's considered a shadow by using the balance slider here. Does that, Brian? That's a great, that's a great yeah. analogy, yeah, absolutely. I think that's awesome. I. I, I, I couldn't put it better than that. The one tip that I'll give people that I didn't learn right away but it's so helpful is when you're pulling that hue slider and the split toning, hold the Option or Alt key and it'll temporarily bump the saturation to 100% so that you can preview the color you want. You get it what? where you want it and then you back it down. Yeah, for, for those of you who don't know, the Alt key is kind of magical in Lightroom. <laughs> like, you can sort of do everything. If you if When in doubt and you want to try something and you're in a development module, hit the Alt key and you'll be like, whoa! That was awesome. Yeah. Man, so, that just paid the, for the whole show for me. That's damn, awesome. There we go. <laughs> damn. Just drop, it. drop the mic and we're done. That's perfect. Brian. Awesome. Um, <clears throat> I've got another. That's a, that's a great tip, and that's one, Brian, too, I didn't really learn until probably several years after using Lightroom. But um, another kind of somewhat related, somewhat cool tip, and not at least along the lines of not being particularly intuitive, if I, if I can, uh, I'll share my screen and jump over to Lightroom, but um, it's kind of a neat thing with, uh, not just with split toning, but in, are you able to see my screen yet? Yes. All right, cool. So I'll just do a quick, just convert this to black and white just for the sake of it. It's and um, too, What's that? It's a great self-portrait, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to, what, what's kind of neat is sometimes you might want to sample a color from the image itself. And uh, when you're doing a split toning, and this can also be used with the local adjustment brush uh, as well. And when you just click on this color swatch and you can pick out a color, it's not as easy to pick the color uh, from the image. And if the image is already grayscale. So let me just back up. So if I want to sample from outside of this color swatch, if I click and hold and drag outside, now I'm sampling from outside of the color swatch. But it's a grayscale image, so we're not seeing that. So what I can do is I'm going to come over to another before and after view, and I'll do top and bottom. And I'm going to make my before. There's the color. And so now I, what I can do is I can sample from the color, you know, before version, and, and use that in my split toning uh, or in my um, local, if I was using a color tint in my adjustment brush and things like that. So it's kind of a neat, uh, a neat little, a not intuitive tip. I'll put it that way. So That's cool. I like that. That's, That's great. Well, so we've we've talked a lot about split toning, but we kind of skipped the presets thing, didn't we? <laughs> yeah, it's fine. Yeah, you know, um, it's there's a workflow, and it's kind of hard in a hangout like this to kind of just drill through a specific, you know, step by step workflow. Um, I'd be curious, uh, for, you know, if Brian wants to share yeah. kind of what your general, you're in a high level, you know, what what's your kind of approach for uh, tackling an image like uh, in a black and white mindset? Yeah, I'd be happy to walk you guys through sort of a really quick color to black and white like I talked about before. Um, I'll just say uh, that on presets, I, I think they're, I still think they're really 
underutilized. I think that if you take the time to come up with some presets and remember that not only can you apply that to one image or a gang of images, but you can even apply presets on import. So you can apply presets as you're pulling images in. So for people who are shooting in controlled lighting or studio or anything like that, take the time to build a preset and apply it on your way in. You're going to save yourself so much time. And even if even if those images need to be tweaked, you don't need to do a dozen things to each one. You know, you need, you need to do like one or two things or just back things down a little bit. Um, I still don't see a ton of people doing that. Once you do that, though, you're going to save yourself a lot of time, and it means you're going to be out in the field shooting a lot more. So, and, um, and just to preempt some of the questions, let, let me just show you how easy it is to make a preset. When you're in the develop module, you just click over here on the presets tab. There's a plus sign, and then you name it, and then you choose which of your adjustments you want to be included in the preset. So when I make those split toning presets, I just click split toning and then click create, and it adds a preset over here. It's, it's just as easy as that. Yeah, and it can be done retroactively. You can go back to an image that you really like and say, capture this particular state or back up in the history and capture this state as a preset. Lightroom's really, really flexible in that regard. And I, I love presets for just giving me some new ideas for images. So, you know, flicking through some of the, the downloaded presets that are that are already there or some that you get from websites. Um, and then they can give you ideas on what to try with an image that you would never have thought of. You know, sometimes split toning colors that you wouldn't have thought would look good, they do. Or sometimes they look terrible, and that's okay, because um, you can figure out what works and what doesn't. Um, the, the black and white uh, presets in particular seem to be what a lot of people start with. I'm not sure if it's an intimidation factor with the HSL um, subpanel, um, but they, they to me seem to be some of the more valuable presets to come preloaded with Lightroom. Yeah, there's some great ones in there. It's a great way to visualize, um, you know, what it might look like in black and white. Uh, and there's all sorts of, you know, cool little tips and tricks. Do you guys want me to walk you through really quick, just super yes, fast please. color to black and That'd white? That'd be awesome. Yeah, let's see your screen and go to town. And while you're looking that up, let's see, uh, did we see any great questions? Um, some people shouting out for Mosaic. That's good. Thank you all. Hangouts I love are, you. Hangouts uh, are recorded, so you can see it later. Um, no Android version, sorry, Marv Duncan. Um, and uh, also, just just a quick reminder while um, O'Brien gets his screen up, that uh, please enter in that contest. It's way up at the top. Unfortunately, I can't put in comments down here to, to repost the link. Um, but if someone could repost that link for us, uh, that it, would be great. It is also on the Hangout page. Oh, great. Okay. Rich Rich posted it there. Okay, so you guys can see my screen. Yes, sir. All right, good deal. So let's take this color image, and just to be fair, let's let's reset this. Um, this is the way it looked coming off the camera. And this is, it's a good example of, you know, again, ask a software guy something, and he's always <laughs> going to give you an answer that backs up the software. But we had this $60,000 uh, amazing light rig in this warehouse for the, sh the shoot, and no matter how we shot it, every image still needed a lot of work. Um, so we'll pop over into the develop module. And I'll just track us from color to black and white and really give you guys just a, a super quick idea of what I would do. Um, so you noticed I've dismissed the panel on the left because I want to see as much of my image as possible. And for the most part, things are laid out in the order that I want to do them. Um, you know what, um, Brian, we don't, we don't actually see your, your uh, panel on the right side. Right. You... Oh, you don't. No, on the Sorry. yeah, your your settings panel. Uh, I think you just got to share, share your entire desktop there. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. That's probably what it is. Yeah. Yeah. Cancel and then do desktop instead of. Desktop. And I don't know how you got Rob's car into the Adobe. Um, <laughs> That's pretty sweet, though. Yeah. Yeah, Rob, did you drive out there? That's good for you. <laughs> yeah, I, I, uh, I, I winter it in California. Yeah, no, <laughs> nice. the salt is not good for a car like that. I can tell you that much. There we go, Brian. Okay, good. So I want to do uh, uh, full screen Lightroom though. If if uh, Shift F one more time. Okay. I'm just I'm telling the Adobe guy. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you're all, all set. right. Okay. <laughs> so I'm going to do a quick white balance adjustment. And the thing that I like to tell tell people here, I think that this is really commonly misunderstood. People will look for something white in the image. Um, you just want to look for something neutral, wherever that might be. Obviously, that was a little cool 
Um, the black on the tires is a pretty good spot. If you ever, um, I always joke that if you take a photo of me, I'm always hiding behind a MacBook, so you can always color balance <laughs> off of that. Um, even though we're going to make this black and white, we're going to, I'm going to have a color mindset throughout, and I'll just really, I'm going to, you know, move through this really fast and just speak to some of this. Um, for the most part, the only time I'm using the exposure slider is if I've left exposure compensation on, which I do tend to do from time to time. I'll remind folks that double-clicking on a slider will return it to its default value. This thing's really blown out, so I'm going to pull the highlights down, and you can see that's really doing its job here. It's, it's, there is a lot of detail. Um, there's a tremendous amount of latitude in a raw file. You can see we recovered all that information on the hood, and if I were to pull this, the shadow slider over, we can see that there's a lot of information hiding in the shadows as well. What I want to end up with at the end is kind of a, a hyper contrasty, gritty sort of warehouse looking shot. So I'm okay with leaving a little bit of the shadow detail hidden. In fact, if we wanted to further compress it, we could pull that black slider over a little. I think that clarity is often uh, overused. You know, people will crank it way, way, way up. Um, if you were to take it to the left, you could really smooth the image out. One of the things I like to do, especially with black and white images, is do a little bit of negative clarity with portraits to soften them. Um, but again, we want this to be gritty, so I'm going to go a little positive clarity. And you can see we're already starting to get a very different look to our image. If we wanted to tune the tone curve, we could do that here. Um, I'll just mention that using that targeted adjustment tool is a nice way to interact with the image, just like you would with black and white. The one other thing I'll point out here, uh, a lot of people see these sliders and they say, you know, those are cool, but I want to have a little more power than that. Um, you can actually grab these little handles at the bottom of the curve, and this is controlling those quadrants of the sliders. So if I pull these little handles over to the, the far edges, we'll see that highlight is only affecting 10%. Oh, nice. um, so it's a lot more precise now. Same thing with shadow. So I think a lot of the time, people coming from Photoshop dismiss these parametric sliders uh, as not being very uh, advanced uh, or, or very precise. But just remember that you can, you can select how you want them to work. Sorry about that. <laughs> Life of a product manager. Uh, and then at this point, I'll come down here and I'll convert this to black and white. And in this particular case, I'll find that I want, it, I want everything to be a little bit uh, more um, so I'll probably go back up and adjust a few things, but before I do that, I want to speak to this S shape that you see uh, with the black and white colors here, and it's not there by accident. We automatically uh, introduce contrast between those different color channels uh, so that they don't all blur and blend together. So you'll notice that there's that's going to happen anytime you do an adjustment, and you can try to guess what these uh, colors map to in the real image, but as mentioned before, it's a lot easier to come in here and just grab a particular part of the image. Now, this image does not have a lot of color data in it, so that wouldn't be very, very effective. I happen to know that there's a yellow spot on the pavement. There's a stripe. Uh, it might actually end up being a little more orange. In this particular case, I'm probably better off doing a global adjustment. So if I want this to be grittier, I might darken it a little. Uh, I might add a little bit more black, I might pop the clarity up a little, and then again something that I think is really often overdone, uh, but we'll do it for this image, is we'll throw a little bit of vignetting in here just to bring the focus to the center and I'll be sure to feather that. So if we go into our before and after, we can see that it's dramatic difference. I'll show you guys a little something that someone showed me the other day that I thought was really cool. Um, I didn't realize that I could come in here with any of these different steps that we've done. Let's say that I really liked it. So you're uh, in the history panel now. Yeah, I'm in my history panel over here. And let's say that I really liked it at this particular spot, which I don't. But I can grab that, and I can pull it over, and I can drop it on one of those uh, befores. So you can make your before state uh, different than the original. Before doesn't have to be the very beginning. Before can be anywhere in between. And I, I use Lightroom all the time. I've been working on it since well before we launched the first beta. And I didn't realize that you could just grab these history states and drag them on 
uh, to change your before. So wow. all sorts of neat stuff you can do there. That's great. That's that's awesome. I, I know that um, uh, we we'd also talked about using the adjustment brush for doing some of the vignetting as well um, for more. Um, I guess a selective vignetting when you want to work around the edges and uh, not have the focus in the center. Um, I know Rob. Rob sometimes, you know, with the with the old Photoshop lingo, calls this sort of dodging and burning a little bit with the adjustment brush. Um, Rob, do, do you have an example of a of a black and white image where you've used the adjustment brush a little bit more? Uh, yeah, and uh, and not even you know, the adjustment brush is certainly great, but you the other local adjustment tools are also. Uh, really useful um, in black and white. Uh, let's, let me pull up. Actually, I want to show you um, something I thought of when Brian was doing that that I thought was kind of even related to what uh, Levi was showing earlier. So I have this image here, which is I created a, a virtual copy of, and this is that one. Um, the other really cool feature to make use of with, uh, with your black and white is making snapshots. And so one of the cool things about a snapshot is you can also use your snapshot to set as the before state. You can't drag and drop it. I don't know why they didn't include that. They didn't include that functionality. <laughs> um, but you can right-click on a snapshot and copy that settings to your before state. So if you wanted to um, set that as your before as you're moving forward and have and go back to your color instead of going back to all the way you know, as it, as it looked when, during import. That's kind of a neat uh, trick to do. The other cool thing about using snapshot is that when you create a snapshot, that snapshot is shared with the other, your master version as well. Um, so if I created a new snapshot now, um, I'll just call this the split toning one. And I go back to the original master version and look at the split toning, that same uh, snapshot is right there. Uh, so that's pretty cool. I mean, snapshots even carry forward. If I were to save, uh, send this over to Photoshop as a smart object, I'd have my snapshots uh, embedded in that smart object as well. So make use of your snapshots as well as your virtual copies in, in any workflow, but I find it to be particularly useful with, with black and white. Um, so, sorry, I, dig I digress. I just want to mention that. Let's see. One... So um, here's an image that has actually a couple opportunities for local adjustments and graduated filters and, and things like that. Um, so here's here's the color uh, version, just before and after wise. Yeah. Um, and so there's a lot of uh, a lot of really good information in there. And what I found, if I step back in my history. Um, go back to uh, before I put in the adjustment brush, is I, th I found it was, uh, you know, a little washed out, and I couldn't really see this particular uh, person kind of standing there. And I thought that person, even though very small in the landscape, was still an interesting uh, point inside this image. And so what I did was used a, um, if we look at my in, my, in the navigator, you can see the progression there. And I kind of made it into a little bit of a spotlight. And so the way that I like to do that is just press the K key and uh, get your adjustment brush. It doesn't really matter what you start your settings on. I often like to do my adjustment brush with it zeroed out. Mm -hmm. And in this case, I'm just going to make um, – let's get rid of this. No, that, one's, that one's okay. I'm just going to make my brush really large. And I'm going to make sure that I have auto mask turned off here. And I'm just going to paint over the whole image. And now I have the overlay on, and that's going to tell me that I'm covering everything. Actually, it looks like my flow is set down low. Let me turn my flow all the way up to 100. And I like to just do this, and this way <laughs> I, like, I can see that I've got the entire image covered. And then I'm going to press the O key and turn off that uh, overlay. And now I can go up and dial in the settings that I want. And I'm just going to darken this down a bit. And now what I want to do is uh, I'm going to hold down the Option key or Alt key, or I could just click on the Erase button here and make an eraser. And I'm just going to kind of brush back over this person, and then I'm going to dial that exposure back up so it's not quite as dramatic. I just want to kind of be a, more of a subtle 
draw of your eye that way. So, so Rob, um, you do that instead of inverting the, the mask on the adjustment brush, right? Well, you can't invert a mask on an adjustment brush. It would be a really cool feature if you could create a mask and then uh, with the adjustment brush and then yeah. invert it like you can with the radial filter. Um, so that, that's even another option. Uh, I like to use the adjustment brush because I think I got used to using that before the radial filter came on the scene. But uh, a similar effect could be done using uh, the radial filter that's new to Lightroom 5, where when you first draw it out, I'm going to hold the shift key down to make it a perfect circle. And this has an invert mask option in it. So if I drill this uh, exposure down, we can see that the spotlight's going on the uh, individual. So that was a lot quicker than doing my adjustment brush technique. But <laughs> old habits die hard, I guess. <laughs> and, and then you can adjust the feather to blend that in a little bit better. But what's cool about the adjustment brush, I mean the, sorry, excuse me, the radial filter, if I hold down the Alt and the Command key and click on this adjustment, it's going to duplicate it. So in one hand, it could be a good way to increase uh, an effect. But I'm going to click Invert now. And now this new adjustment, and I'll move this off it so you can see there's actually two pins in there. Um, in the second pin, I can zero out my exposure, and I can brighten it up. Or I can do bring in any of the other settings here. I can use clarity or sharpness or things like that. To This is somewhat heavy-handed, so you can see it. But um, you can use these uh, local adjustment tools to further enhance your black and white. There's, there's a lot you can do using um, the HSL panel to create that color, the separations in the colors in your black and white. But sometimes I think you really need to get in there and uh, finish finish off the image with adjustment brush or graduated filter um, and so on. Yeah, I love that, Rob. That's that's terrific. Yeah, that looks like she's standing in front of a lighthouse now, but, uh, <laughs> but you, you kind of get the idea. Um, the other thing I was going to show since I've got the screen um, <laughs> is uh, this is my friend Max um, who was wearing a very large Frisbee, but <laughs> what was nice about the Frisbee was the, the colors in it. And um, I just wanted to just show, throw out another uh, approach to making a, a conversion. And similar to using the black and white uh, button here, um, this is one a technique I learned, I think, from Martin Evening way back, maybe in Lightroom 2 or 3, that he had come up with as, a, as an alternative to the black and white, which is using the HSL panel set to saturation and zeroing out all of the saturation sliders all right, to get to your grayscale. And this one actually could be saved as a preset. So if I uh, wanted to, and actually I already have this as a preset, um, click on this and just check the box for color adjustment uh, to include just the settings in this panel. I already have one uh, just called minus 100 saturation. What that gives you uh, that the black and white option doesn't inside the black and white panel. If you click on that black and white button here, you lose the vibrance and saturation sliders. They just gray out. Um, but when you zero out the saturation like this, you can still finesse your image somewhat with the using the vibrance and saturation sliders to uh, cool. fine-tune your, fine your look, depending on how you're going to approach it, as well as your white balance is going to have an effect on that. Well, and white balance still has an effect on on the. Yes, it does. Yeah, uh, yeah, you're right. I yeah. I didn't mean to say that was that was different, but um, take it back. Take it I back. I, I, I take it back. I take it back. <laughs> it's all, it's also Rob how you can do that that lovely effect that we saw a lot of in the '90s where you add a single color to like. A yeah, I'm not game. I'm not going there. No, you're not doing that. I thought that was <laughs> your favorite effect. Um, but th what you can then do is go over to the luminance tab, and grab that adjustment the uh, target adjustment tool. And now you can adjust the brightness and, or darkness of the colors um, this way. So this, this does the same kind of thing as clicking the, the black and white and then adjusting uh, the individual colors. But you can still have that control over individual colors uh, to brighten and darken them um, this way. So that's just another, just another approach. Um, I don't know that one's better or worse. It's just another, another way to kind of get to the same end there. 
So that's cool. Cool, cool. Thanks, guys. Well, we're we're coming up uh, close to time, so I'm going to um, just do one more plea for people to enter into our contest. Uh, and just one caveat too: uh, this is only available on uh, this podcast. This this podcast, this Google Plus Hangout is going to be recorded for everybody. You have to be present in the live version to win this contest. So please enter now because we're going to be closing it and announcing the winner in a second. Um, and uh, I actually see our previous winner here, six, uh, who is. Um, was here. He won uh, the last uh, the last Google Plus Hangout we have, and it looks like he's enjoying the app. So that's that's awesome. So let's, let's do a speed round, and we'll do one quick tip from from each of our guests. Um, I don't know who wants to start first because I'm putting everybody on the spot. But what's a uh, one one quick tip about black and white that you'd love to share with everybody that we didn't get to today? I'll take Brian, it real quick. Uh, yeah, do it, Brian. Okay, so I would just say, um, you know, when people think about, I'm not going to show it. I'll just speak to it. When people think about HDR, they always think about color, um, but Play around with HDR uh, and black and white. In fact, especially because you can take a 32-bit file from Photoshop and you can put that back in Lightroom and use all those controls. And if you want to get high contrast black and whites or just this incredible dynamic range, uh, I think that black and white with HDR is way more fun than color. It doesn't look as ridiculous, um, and it's, it really taps into a lot of the reasons people got into black and white to begin with, which is to sort of get that Ansel Adams, you know, sort of uh, red filter, crazy contrasty look. So that's that's my tip. Awesome. Who wants to jump in next? Thanks, Brian. That's a great one. Let's see, Rob. Can I go last? <laughs> Did we lose Rob? Is he, is he stuck? Well, I'll go next then. Um, my tip has to do with the split toning one more time. Um, I've, I've made a bunch of split toning presets that I, I like to use. Um, I had to turn on my screen, huh? There we go. And so I've got, I've got these split toning presets that I love to use on my black and whites. My favorite one is the one with, with the split toning set to zero so that when I am playing around with different... Um, with the different presets, I can always pop back to my standard black and white in a single click. So I make the split toning presets, but then I have one with the split toning set to neutral so that I can go back to that real quickly. Awesome. I don't know if we have one from, from Rob or if he's Yeah, here sorry. Today. No, I had I muted my mic because I have I'm getting I'm at the tail end of a cold and I keep coughing, so I'm trying not to uh, to do that on air. Um, so I just want to highlight the link for that contest, Mosaic Archive. Uh, Rich did put in the Hangout page there, mosaicarchive.com slash Google hyphen Lightroom hyphen Hangout hyphen contest. So I head over we there. Done, we we could have done a shorter link. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that's what you're yeah. Yeah. So head head over there and do that before this ends. And also the code for the fifty dollars off Photoshop World is is there as well. Um, and I'll be there, and it be great to do a little photo focus hangout in person at Photoshop World for anyone's there, and you know, Brian's there. Yeah. Um, the thing that I wanted to call out, um, not so much as a specific specific tip, but uh, this is a, a somewhat, uh, it's an e-book. It's a little older in that it came out, I think, with Lightroom 3 uh, by Pete Vandenide who I think I've just butchered your name, sorry, Pete. Uh, I invited him to come as well to our Hangout, but unfortunately he couldn't make it today. But this is a really excellent uh, book for uh, anyone interested in, in checking out Black and White, and it's where I got the idea for my little color wheel um, that's behind me today. So I just want to give him a little shout-out for that. And I'll give one quick tip as well is in the um, in the luminance field uh, for black and white as well as for color images. I love to pull down the blues if you have any sky in it. Um, it tends to yeah. take uh, all the color of the sky and um, and make it a little bit darker. And so you can uh, you can have some really good effects and you don't have blown out skies in a lot of your photos. So with that, I have uh, my my friend Steve who is uh, manning our contest right now. And Steve, you can go ahead and close it. Um, let's close the contest. Should just take a second, and I believe if folks will refresh their page if they're on it, or if um, Levi, if you want to show that page there, uh, it should announce the winner to folks in real time. Oh, on the uh, on the page itself. I believe so. I believe so. Like I might be wrong there. about this. We're using this in real time here. So <laughs> we are. I'm loading the page. And let's see if uh, Steve has closed it and it has updated for us. We had 140. Let's go. 
and we, we can say that this is not Mosaic, this is they, this is Rafflecopter. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, we can see if it has announced a winner. If if, uh, if we do not get to the winner right now, we will email the winner. Um, and again, there's two prizes here. It's six months of Mosaic's professional plan for free. Uh, that includes the app, and it's also an ebook copy of Rob's um, book. And anybody that enters will also get emailed the free Lightroom preset from Levi. So let's try one more time. And if not, we will make sure we email the winner and people can check back to this page. Yeah, why don't we, uh, why don't we see where everybody oh, is online? Well, looks like we then... got the winner is David S. For, um, for the Mosaic. And I don't know who the other winner is. But we can figure that out. But David S., you are a winner. Congratulations. Thank you for okay. coming. Um, this would like to thank our panelists one more time. Brian O'Neill Hughes from Adobe, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks. Where can we where can we find you, Brian? <clears throat> oh, where can you find me? Uh, <laughs> I'll obviously, be at Photoshop World. Um, I'm I'm sort of behind the scenes on our uh, social media properties for Adobe. So, um, the Facebook page for Photoshop is actually uh, really great, and for Lightroom as well. There's a lot of really cool content there. I've done a ton of courses for Lynda.com. Uh, so, if you guys want to learn more about black and white, I did a course on uh, Lightroom and Photoshop there. Uh, the book's a little old now. It's it's not that it's changed that much, but there are two versions of the black and white book. Uh, you can find those on Amazon. But I'm I don't know. I'm all over the place. Yeah, Brian. <laughs> well, it's done, Brian. Brian's very accessible. Um, yeah. Not to say that any of the other product managers are not, <laughs> uh, but Brian, you know, I've seen him teach a number of times. He's always handing out his email address. He's he's very uh, accessible and and easy to get a hold of. So definitely take him up on that. B Hughes at Adobe.com. See, look at that. Look at that. <laughs> um, and uh, Rob Sylvan, thanks for joining us as well. Where can we find you, Rob? Uh, under about three feet of snow <laughs> uh, right now. Um, but yeah, no, um, uh, lightrumors.com is my blog. But hey, I just started re blogging at photofocus.com. So I'm excited to be redoing that and just got a post up this week. So Awesome. And uh, Levi, where can we find you? I'm at photofocus.com as well as levisim.com, and I'll be at WPPI next week if anybody wants to meet up. I'll be, I'll be doing some shoots there if anybody wants to go have some fun. And uh, hopefully I'll make it to Photoshop World this spring also. All right. Awesome. And uh, I'm Gerard Murphy. Uh, I am uh, at Gerard Murphy 3, Gerard at mosaicarchive.com, but I usually am the voice of at Mosaic Archive, our corporate Twitter, which uh, is... is it's full of Lightroom tips and not too many sales commercials, I promise you. So please uh, check <laughs> us out there. So um, thank you all for joining our, our Hangout. I hope you learned a little bit. This will be recorded and will be sliced and diced into sort of 10-minute segments for the PhotoFocus website. So uh, please stay tuned for our next Hangout, which will be uh, next month. And uh, the topic is, uh, I think, TBD. But uh, it will be something Lightroom related. So <laughs> thank you all for joining us. And uh, hopefully we'll see you guys online somewhere. Thanks, guys. Take care, thank everybody. You. Bye. Thanks.